Welcome to another session on CL4 corporate law. During our previous like, discussions, we have been discussing on various areas pertaining to companies and company law. Today, we are going to proceed further with certain topics that are addressed in the company law and in the Companies Act 2007, number 7 of 2007 in particular. So today I'm going to start with the topic in the management rule. Now we know that a company is a separate and distinct person from the natural persons that are uh, either owning a company or administering and managing a company such as shareholders on one side and the directors on the other. <clears throat> now, when a company is performing in such a way, such a manner, there are other people and entities who are uh, dealing with such company. When these third parties who are dealing with such companies, they tend to believe that the company that they are dealing with has the necessary legal existence and such company can do uh, or act in accordance with the articles of association of the company as well as any other bylaws pertaining to that company. This is the confidence that a company should provide to the third parties that are dealing with. So the third parties who are dealing with such companies verily believe that the company to have the necessary competence under the law to deal with the related matters. <clears throat> the company's internal management is conducted by those who are in office. So as long as a company is performing as per its Articles of Association and Bylaws, such company uh, tend to act in a manner that is consistent with the company law in general. And also, there is no question or suspicion regarding the company affairs and even the court would not interfere or intervene with the affairs of the company. Now, under the common law, the general common law, a person acting in good faith <coughs> and without knowledge of any irregularity who is dealing with a corporation need not inquire about the formality of the internal proceedings of the corporation. As I mentioned to you earlier, the third parties who are dealing with the company need not look into the fact whether such company is acting in line with the company procedures. Because it is a presumption for the third parties that this particular company is acting in the proper manner. <coughs> but is entitled to assume that there has been <coughs> compliance with the articles and bylaws. So these third parties are entitled to assume that this particular company is acting in compliance with its articles of association and the bylaws that are uh, controlling and administering <coughs> this company. This Indo management rule where third parties need not 
go into much of a detail and look, in, look inside the company is a principle that is known as the Indo management rule. It is a rule or principle that is known as the Indo management rule. This was <coughs> authoritatively laid down in the 19th century British case of Royal British Bank versus Turquoise. Now, in this case, what happened was that Mr. Turquoise was the official manager or the liquidator of the, ins of the insolvent Cameroons, Camerons, Colebrook, Steam, Coal and Swansea and the Loffer Railway Company. So, Mr. Turquoise was uh, the appointed manager liquidator who was looking into the insolvency of this particular company. It was incorporated under the Joint Stock Companies Act 1844, the former regime in that era, <coughs> uh, under which the companies existed in Britain. The company had given a bond for 2000 pounds to the Royal British Bank. Now, you know what is a bond? A bond is an undertaking where the undertaker becomes obliged to honor a certain thing, otherwise, which would result in a liability to compensate to the person who is taking such undertaking or such guarantee. So, this particular company likewise had given entered into a bond of 2000 pounds to the Royal British Bank, which secured the company's drawings on its current account. <coughs> the bond was under the company's seal, signed by two directors and secretary. So, the bond was legally and properly executed, having the company seal, signatures of two directors and of the secretary of the company. When the company was sued for not, for not obliging to the bond, it alleged that or the, rather the company alleged that under its registered deed of settlement, what they referred to as the articles of association at that particular time, directors only had power to borrow up to an amount authorized by a company resolution. So, the company took a, dear, took a stand that <coughs> according to their articles of association, the directors only had the power to borrow and up to the amount that was authorized by a company resolution. A resolution had been passed, but not specifying how much the directors could borrow. There was a resolution passed to borrow, but the amount or the sum to be borrowed was not mentioned in the resolution. It was just a open resolution that the directors could borrow, but to what amount was not mentioned in the resolution. Now, in this case, Sir John Jervis, Chief Justice for the Court of Exchequer Chamber ruled that the bond was valid. So, the Royal British Bank could enforce the terms. He said the bank was deemed to be aware that the directors could borrow only up to the amount resolutions allowed. Articles of association were registered with companies house like the register of companies in Sri Lanka. So, they have a constructive notice of its of the company's power to borrow, but the bank could not be deemed to know which ordinary resolution passed because there were no there these were not registrable. The bond was valid because there was no requirement to look into the company's internal workings by the issuing bank. 
the bank did not have any duty to look into the internal procedures of the particular company. And therefore, the bond that was executed by the bank was valid because the bank stood on the ground or the facts that when the company has given a proper valid resolution, the bank could rely upon that resolution that gave the power to the directors to borrow and the bond entered by the bank with the company was therefore valid. This is the indoor management rule that a company's indoor affairs are company's problems. It is not for an outside party or for a third party before it enters into certain transaction likewise to see whether the company has complied with all required matters. Basically, the company resolution has unveiled the fact that the company directors had the power to borrow under the resolution that was passed. So, that was quite enough for the bank to rely upon the fact that this company had the power to borrow by entering into this bond. So, the court rule that it is not for a third party to look inside the company because the indoor management rule prevents the bank from going into more further details or finer details of the company whereas, there exists of a resolution that was legally valid upon which the bank gave this bond. So, this is a this was the turning point in the company law in England that by case law the Indo management rule was upheld as a principle relating to companies. <clears throat> the rule in the Turquoise case was not accepted as being firmly entrenched in law until it was endorsed by the House of Lords in Mahoney versus East Holyford Mining Company case in 1875. You see the Turquoise case happened in 1856 and later this was upheld in this case of Mahoney versus East Holyford Mining Company in 1875. Lord Hatherley stated that in this particular case, when there, the, there are persons conducting the affairs of a company in a manner which appears to be perfectly consonant with the articles of association, those so dealing like the outside parties, like third parties dealing with them externally are not to be affected by irregularities which may take place in the internal management of a company. So, the company is therefore confined to its internal proceedings or procedures. So, whoever who is dealing from outside would be looking at the affairs from outside. It need not go inside to look because the principle of Indo management rule protects these third parties or outside parties from not going into the internal management process of a company. So, later in this 1875 case, the Turquoise case rule was upheld and made it solid principle recognized under English law. 
However, it is sometimes possible for an outsider to ascertain whether an internal requirement or procedure has been complied with. Although the law protects outsiders from this rule, where such outsider need not look into the internal procedures in a company, it is rather common that those who are really entering into transactions with companies, transactions of very important nature, really look into the company's affairs, whether that particular company has taken the proper decisions in entering into such transaction. If it is possible to ascertain this fact from the company's public documents, the doctrine of disclosure and the doctrine of constructive notice will apply and not the Turquoise rule. Now, in case an outsider makes much of inquiry into a company's affairs, that means that outsider is, is in fact, going more than what he or she ought to do and entering into an area that would not give that outsider the protection as of the Indo management rule. In such a case, then the outsider is in fact putting himself into trouble, so that he is no more secured than from the Indo management rule. If he makes a certain inquiry of the public documents of the company, then also he is relying upon the disclosure doctrine and the doctrine of constructive notice where he is, he is expecting to obtain more notice of the company's internal affairs, then the internal management rule will not protect that person because as I mentioned to you, this person or the entity has gone in more to in uh, inside or internal into the company's affairs, surpassing the requirements established under the Turquoise case. The Turquoise rule was formulated to keep an outsider's duty to inquire into the affairs of a company within reasonable bond, bounds, within reasonable bounds. That is to say that anybody who is like an outsider or third party who is entering into transactions with a company generally requires to be informed of the general nature of affairs of a company within reasonable bonds and not go more into the internal affairs of a company that would surpass the turquoise rule requirement. But if the compliance or non-compliance with an internal requirement can be ascertained from the company's public documents, the doctrine of disclosure and doctrine of constructive notice will apply. That means that if the third party or the outsider go more into the company's internal affairs, then it is expected that this outsider has really gone beyond his requirement of knowing about the company. If it is an internal requirement that a certain act should be approved by special resolution, the Turquan rule will thereafter therefore not apply in relation to that specific act. Since a special resolution is registered with company's house 
and is deemed to be public information. So suppose that the outsider requires a special resolution for a certain transaction, then that means that outsider has gone more into the company's internal affairs, so that he would not obtain the security that is afforded under the Turquoise rule. So he is going more insight into the company. And generally we know that when there is a special resolution passed by a company, unlike a general resolution, the company has to file it with the register of companies. In that case, the particular special resolution becomes a public document. It is no more a private document of the company. It is a public document that anybody can see. So if the third party or the outside party go inside, likewise, then losers is right to rely upon the Turquoise rule. So this is about the internal management of a company that is very important for you all to know that an outsider or a third party is thus protected from the Turquoise rule as long as this outsider or the third party does not go more beyond the allowed parameter or permitted parameter and going inside the company and if that, that, that is done then that particular outsider or the third party loses his right to rely upon the Turquoise rule. And then in that case, the standard of care increases, whereas this outsider or third party will be more scrutinized in ascertaining whether such person has really done the correct thing or not. Now just imagine that in the Turquan rule, suppose that the bank that gave the bond has required more from the director board like a special resolution. Then of course they can rely upon the fact that they were unknown of the internal procedures of the company. They were unknown of the fact that the directors really did not have the power to borrow a particular sum because most scrutiny have been applied by the bank in such a case. So suppose that happened, the Turquoise rule would not have been applied in that case. So internal management rule is something that would protect the third parties or the outsiders dealing with the company. Whatever the disputes or whatever the complications that a particular company had internally would not affect the third party or the outsider dealing with the company being prejudiced thereafter. Next topic I would like to talk about is the solvency test. Now what do you mean by solvency? Solvency means that a company can meet its liabilities with the remaining assets at a particular stage which means that the company would not go into bankruptcy. The company can meet its liabilities, pay out the creditors if any and at least the company accounts balance sheets can be brought to zero rather than letting them to go to minus figures. So, 
check in the solvency of a company is a very important aspect to determine whether a company remains sound and not at loss. So, the solvency test is expected and required to be carried out from time to time, especially by the directors of a company in order to make sure that the shareholders at least the share value is secured within the company. End of the day that the shareholders will not run into adverse situations as the company even at a closure can still be solvent at least to bring the balance sheets to zero as I mentioned. So, now let us see what is solvency. Solvency is the ability of a company to meet its, its long term debts and financial obligations. As I mentioned that solvency is a thing that the company can meet its long term debts, debts and the financial obligations that the company has towards creditors as well as to those who have claims against the company for what is payable by the company. Solvency is essential to staying in business as I mentioned to you before it is important for a company to know that whether the company can remain in business or whether the company is going into a bankruptcy situation as it demonstrates a company's ability to continue operations into the foreseeable future, foreseeable future that to a future that the company can foresee. The company can be assured that its operations and business activities can be carried forward without the company becoming a total loss. While a company also needs liquidity to thrive and pay off its short term obligations. Such short term liquidity should not be confused with solvency. Sometimes the companies when they do have short term liabilities, the directors might run into panic. But however, with its long term prospects, there may not need of such a panic as in the long run the company may be able to secure its short term losses with long term gains. Now, we know in any business the first few years are the most difficult years because the expenditure may be more than the income. Now, there is the short term loss that a company may experience, but that does not mean that after several years the company start profiting and that profit can offset the losses incurred during those previous years. So, short term losses are not really an issue in conducting the solvency test. Such short term liquidity should be not be confined to solvency. A company that is insolvent will often enter into bankruptcy, but however, when a company 
at a certain situation or stage that its business affairs cannot be conducted in a proper manner would rather run into insolvency and no more can maintain a solvency within it. So, insolvency in the sense that the company is running into a bankruptcy situation. Then when a company falls into such a situation and there is no way that the company can be salvaged, <coughs> then we know that the company is anyway running into a bankruptcy situation. Now that is a situation where the company is set to experience the insolvency and that it cannot proceed further. So that the directors have to take extra cautions of the company's existence and report to the shareholders to take the decision maybe to close down the business affairs of the company. A company satisfies the solvency test. So, when the solvency test is taken by the directors, when the company is able to pay its debts as they become due or what we call the cash flow test, then the company is said to be solvent. Also that where the value of the company's asset is greater than the value of the liabilities as I mentioned you that which is called the net asset test. Then also the solvency of the company is met. So, there are two ways in determining solvency of a company. First way is where the company is able to pay its debts as they become due, as they become due. which is called a cash flow test. The second situation is where the value of the assets, company's assets is greater than the value of the liabilities, which is called the net asset test. So, the solvency test can be tested or carried out by considering the cash flow test as well as the net asset test. The distributors the distributions, I beg your pardon, covered by the solvency test include, now when you are doing a solvency test, you need to properly identify the distributions that need to be done by the company. When a company closes, we know that the company's liabilities that are due, especially to the investors, have to be settled. So, it is not the time that you think that you can pay out to the creditors, but on top of that, you need to ascertain whether the real contributors to the company who are entitled for a return the return on investment can be met. So, these include that the company's dividends paid out to the shareholders at the end of a financial year. Then share buybacks, if the company buy back the shares from the shareholders and the company is so capable of settling out the money for the buyback of the shares. Then tender offers, where the company has put out certain tenders and as per the tenders may be supply certain things to the company, the company is able and capable to fulfill the payments, 
payment obligation and other share redemptions, even in the case of a redemption of shares. Though this is not exhaustive list of all methods which a company may distribute assets to members. So then we say that if the company is capable of doing or able of doing these things, meeting out its liabilities, then the company is solvent. The board of directors must approve a certificate. Now, when conducting a solvency test and arriving at its conclusions, determinations, determinants, the board of directors must approve by way of a certificate that in their opinion the company will immediately after payment of the dividend distributions satisfy the solvency test. That means upon the settlement of dividends and other distribution, the company is still solvent. So the directors have to give a certificate to that effect. So then the investors in very specifically know that the company is solvent, com company is capable of going forward. There is no issue with regard to any closure, the company can survive. And also the directors must state that the grounds for that, their op that opinion and also in the same certificate, the directors are obliged to underline the grounds on which that they arrived at a decision that the company is solvent. So they have to give the assurance that the company, company is solvent. This certificate must be signed on the board's behalf at least by one director. Now why one director? Because generally we say that the board has a collective responsibility and the directors of the board have mutual responsibility against each other. The board has a collective responsibility to act together and also each of the directors have mutual liability or responsibility with regard to the decisions of the board. So one director can't say, oh I don't know, I don't agree with the decision of another director or I don't take the liability for what another director has done. As long as they are in the board, the decisions of the board, the decisions of the board are collectively are collective and operate on mutual basis against each other. If a particular director has any objection with regard to a decision, then he, it is his duty to record his objection and that he is not in favor of the decision. That only will give such director the liberty to stay outside what has been decided by the board. So in that case, that particular director who would stay outside would not later on fall into liability issues because he has already protested against the arriving at a certain decision. So that is why decisions are also passed as to a certain proportion. Say if there are five directors, a valid decision would be if there are fractions, then 3 to 2. 
But however, in actual practice, the boards of companies arrive at unanimous decisions. So that to maintain consistency and harmony within the board, that later on the company will be obliged to stand by the decisions of the board. So therefore, the, in the solvency test, a certificate, issuing of the certificate is a must from the company and that should state these two grounds, the requirements as I have mentioned to you and it should be signed by at least one director because then the other directors will be automatically bound by such decision. A distribution made to a shareholder at a time when the company did not satisfy the solvency test may be recovered by the company from shareholders subject to certain conditions. Now suppose that there is a distribution made to a shareholder where the company was not really capable of doing so. Then whoever the shareholder who has received such distribution by way of dividend or whatever, then will be liable to watch the company to reimburse that. So the company can recover from such shareholder. There may be sometimes certain conditions with regard to such reimbursement, where the distribution cannot be recovered in case a distribution already made cannot be recovered from that shareholder, then the directors can be personally liable. Directors can be personally liable because directors have had known their act of giving away or awarding the distribution. So they have to be extra cautious here too that they would not make a distribution when the company was really unable to meet up that distribution and because of that the directors of the company may become personally liable. Those directors who have approved such a distribution will be personally liable for doing so. This is to protect the company from such mishandling of affairs. Corporate insolvencies happen because companies become excessively indebted. Invariably, the shareholders, directors and employees liabilities is limited to the amount of their investment because of the share that they take. So against commercial creditors, they can lose no more than the money they paid for shares or their jobs. Insolvencies become intrinsically possible whenever relationship of credit and debt is created as frequently happen through contracts or other obligations. So this is general, this general knowledge that a company failing to meet its debt, fall into indebted situations and the company's solvency cannot be maintained there onwards. In the case of BNY Corporate Trustee Services Limited versus Eurosail UK uh, 2007 3 BL PLC, this is also an important English case that occurred very recently in 2013. In, it, it said, the court said that the English law draws a distinction between a debt which is relevant for the cash flow test of insolvency under section 121, 23, 1, 
E of the Companies Act in UK and a liability, death on one side, liability on another side, liability which becomes relevant for the second balance sheet test. of insolvency under section 122 subsection 2. A death is a sum due, sum due to a creditor and its quantity is a monetary sum, it is obviously a monetary sum. Whatever the money that has been borrowed from a creditor to the company is due to that creditor under the certain conditions that they have entered into. easily ascertained by drawing up an account. So, the company maintains such accounts. By contrast, a liability will need not be quantified. Now, on the other hand, a liability of a company need not be quantified. It may vary. As for instance, with a claim for breach of contract, and unliquidated damages. The claimant who is seeking the company's liability in case of such a breach will come up with a certain figure demanding the company to pay, which is quite unliquidated. Now, we know that whenever there is a breach of contract, then it gives an opportunity for the claimant to claim inexhaustive list of claims as a result of the breach that took place. So, it is not fixed unlike in the case of a debt due to a creditor which is defined or I mean it is an amount that the creditor has given to the company. But when it comes to a liability such as a breach of contract, it is not a certain amount. The amount may depend on the claim, could be very much of unliquidated damages. The balance sheet test that is maintained as for the creditors loans or amounts that have been given to the company ask whether the value of the company's asset is less than the amount of its liabilities. So, in that case, when the balance sheet provides information that a company's balance out of the business is at least sufficient to pay out its debts. And it is whether less than the amount of its liabilities, take into account of its contingent and prospective liabilities. So, when the solvency test is conducted and the balance sheet is done, then we need to analyze whether the balance that the company has is quite sufficient to pay out the debts owed to the creditors and not capable of meeting the liabilities that may come later on with some other issues. Then in that case, the company is set to move into an insolvent C situation. So, we have to be careful in determining the solvency that it is not only the prevailing debt, but also whether the company is capable of meeting its future liabilities that may come up at any time. Then only the director should be aware of whether the company can 
said to be solvent or not. As per section 57 of our Companies Act number 7 of 2007, a company shall be deemed to have satisfied the solvency test. Now, this is our statutory law, Companies Act that states about the solvency test. It is able to pay its debts as they become due in the normal course of business and the value of the company's assets is greater. The value of its liabilities and the company's stated capital. So, this is actually very much similar to what I showed to you before on the rationale of a solvency test. So, the our statutory law very much fulfill the elements that are required to satisfy the general solvency test, but having a look at the words that have been used in our law, it is quite burdensome on the company, because the first part is not that serious, but the second part. That means, the value of the company's assets is greater than the value of the liabilities and the company's stated capital. It is very, very descriptive in that sense. In determining whether a company satisfies the solvency test, our law says further, the board shall take into account the most recent financial statements of the company and shall take into account circumstances the directors know or ought to know which affect the value of the company's assets and liabilities and may take into account a fair valuation and other method of assessing the value of its assets and liabilities. So, this statutory implication of our law go into much of detail that what the duty of directors in carrying out a solvency test. So, the directors will be bide by to proceed with more procedural aspects of determining the solvency of the company rather than standing on the general nature of duty that the directors are casted with. With the solvency test, we are now going to move into the topic of minority shareholders. Now, these are elements of companies and company and how company law apply to these elements. Now, we know that the shareholders of a company are the real human owners of a, of a company. Even though a company has its own distinct separate legal personality or what we call a juridical person before the law. The company is mainly invested by the human shareholders and run by the directors, but under the guidance of the shareholders as in accordance with the articles of association. Now, among the shareholders or rather the investors, they are may have majority shareholders and minority shareholders. Now, in a case where a company has Fifty percent, fifty percent shareholding between two directors, two directors, sorry, two shareholders, two shareholders. Then both these shareholders are said to be equal shareholders. So there is no question of who is 
a major shareholder and who is a minor shareholder because both have the same number of shareholding. The moment that one shareholder owes 51 percent and the other shareholder thereafter has 49, this is also two shareholder situation, then this shareholder becomes major shareholder and this whole share becomes minor shareholder, minor shareholder. If you take a situation where there are say 10 shareholders, 10 shareholders, in that case maybe that one particular shareholder has 25 percent, the other shareholder has 7 percent, another shareholder has 3 percent, one shareholder has 8 percent, the other shareholder has 2 percent, so I have to calculate all these things. There is anyway 10 here, 10 here 20, 20 plus 25 is 45, then we can put another one having 5 percent another one having 11 percent, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So, all together there is 10, 10, 45, 50, 61, another one having 9 percent, 70. So, we have 70, then we have 2 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 2 more shareholders who may have say 13 percent, seventeen percent. So, here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 shareholders and the one that has the majority of the shares which is 25 is the major shareholder and the rest become minor shareholders, minor shareholders. But also we see that when these people either collectively taken together, they become major and he becomes minor. But as long as they are individual, this shareholder is a major and the other shareholders are minor. In a certain circumstances, if say for example, this one, this one, this one, this one 20, 25 and this one join together, in that case their shareholding becomes major. But generally in a company, the shareholding will decide the majority and minority of such shareholders. Now, what is the significance of holding majority shares? Majority shareholders have more power because in company law we know each share gives one vote. So, in exercising the votes at a meeting, a major shareholder will always have the edge over the rest of the shareholders. So, they have more controlling powers than the minor shareholders. But however, the law has protected the minor shareholders by giving certain rights that the major shareholders cannot 
suppress minor shareholders to the extent that the minor shareholders fall into situations that would prejudice their rights in the company. So, the minority shareholders do have certain entitlements, rights to safeguard themselves in the company structure and this is a very important area in the company law. A minority shareholder is defined as a shareholder who does not exert control of a company as I mentioned to you. It is the major shareholder will have a more control of the company. So, the minor shareholders will have lesser say than the major shareholders. The majority shareholders almost always exert an ab absolute control over the company, its management, its board of directors and so on. Because holding such a majority shares will enable him more powers in putting more directors under his control. And each of the other minor shareholders will have less powers in appointing their own directors or collectively some other directors. So, in such a situation, the minority shareholders need to be protected because the major shareholders will have more power in the company affairs. However, the definition of minor shareholders will include those shareholders who do not exert control over the board of directors of the company, companies, even if together they own the majority shares, like I told you here. Even though they may hold a larger number of shares in the entire company, when it comes to the director board, they may not have a bigger control than what the majority shareholder has. And the majority shareholders are defined as those who control the board of directors of companies, even if effectively they own much less than the majority of the shares. Here there consists of 75 percent, here consists of 25, but 75 percent is divided among 9. So, the majority shareholder would still have more control over the board. The origin of the abuse of minority shareholders come mainly from the greed of some of the majority shareholders. Always the problems occur in companies because of the majority shareholders are trying to suppress the minority shareholders and take up a hand, who in some cases have no limits. Sometimes various problems occur in companies because the majority shareholders are not only greed, but they are also very controlling over the affairs of the company and the minority shareholders are quite prejudicial disadvantaged. Those majority shareholders believe that they can do anything because of the fact that they are holding the majority shares and they can risk more and more since they find themselves unpunished because the majority shareholders might think that since we are holding majority shares in this company, we can do anything, we will not be punished for what we are doing because we have a controlling power. Even the board of directors will be in the side of the majority shareholders because the majority of the board of directors are appointees of such major shareholder or shareholders. Those majority, uh, so since they find themselves unpunished, 
by remaining within the very large margins of the law. Because the, even the law provides more opportunity, more security for major shareholders. However, the law is there to balance this. So, the law has given minority shareholders also the rights that the majority shareholders cannot take over the control of a company in a manner where the minority shareholders will be extremely disadvantaged or prejudiced. Because you, we need to balance these two sections. For the benefit of whom? For the benefit of the company. Otherwise, it is the company that is going to suffer. It is the company that is going to uh, collapse in a situation where there are too, ma too many problems because of this power struggle, because of the tug of war between the minority shareholders and the majority shareholders. So, in order to provide the balance, the law has come to secure the minority shareholders. One of the two principles is that where a wrong has been done to a company, only the company, not individual members, can take action and is referred to as the proper plaintiff principle. Now, whenever there is a problem for a company, by virtue of the company having a legal personality, it is the company that has the power to appear by itself in any court of law. If we have a problem against a company, we have to file action against the company. If it has a problem regarding us by a company, the company has to sue us and not the shareholders at any instance. Say for example, if company A enters into a contract with a person or entity called B, then in case of a breach by B, the company A has to sue B in the name of the company, which means that then the case would be A versus B. If B has a problem in this contract against the company, then B has to sue the company in its own name and style. That means B versus A. So, C, D, E, F, whoever who are the shareholders of a company will not be parties to the case because the company represents all those people. The company can stand by itself before the law because the law recognizes the company as a legal person. Proper, this is called proper plaintiff principle. Pro proper plaintiff principle. They are the company itself can be the plaintiff to sue someone. It does not have to rely upon the natural people to come forward on behalf of a company and sue the liable party. This is the company can sue, which is called the proper principle, proper plaintiff principle. The second principle is that the will of the majority of the members of the company should in general prevail in the running of the business. That means, in a company, if the shareholding is, defined, is divided likewise, then the will of the majority will be the main force of that company, it should prevail and this is called the majority rule principle, majority rule principle. Now, when it comes to majority rule principle, it can either be the majority shareholder 
who falls within the majority rule principle or in some situations where the majority shareholder is doing something wrong, all these minority shareholders can get together and form the majority rule principle and attack the majority shareholder. So, the majority rule principle prevails in a company for the benefit and the interest of this artificial person, the company. Now, there is a exhaustive list of minority shareholders rights that can be highlighted. having considered the entire companies law and companies act. In various uh, 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 provisions in the law, we may find that the law has provided certain various rights to minority shareholders in different different sections. They are not like mentioned in one particular section, but all throughout the companies law, we can find how the law has provided rights to minority shareholders. Now, I do not think that I have to explain each and every one, since it is a very exhaustive one. Uh, one right is that the minority shareholders has the right to amend the articles of association by special resolution with the requisite of at least 75 of the total votes likewise. To be supplied with copies of constitutional documents, they are entitled to receive constitutional documents such as the articles of association and other company resolutions. Then inspect the register of members, inspect the register of directors, they have the right then remove a director from office by ordinary resolution with special notice by simple majority likewise. Approve director's loan term service contract by simple majority. Approve substantial property transactions between company and director by simple majority. Approve loans to directors with simple majority. Approve payment to directors for loss of office with simple majority. Then inspect a copy of the term of director service agreements, inspect a copy of the terms of directors indemnity provisions, ratification of any acts of directors in breach of duty by simple majority, bring proceedings on behalf of the company in derivative actions against a defaulting director, we will be dealing with derivative actions later. Inspect the register of secretaries without a charge they are entitled to. Receive a copy of any written resolution proposed by directors. Bring actions against directors on grounds of oppression and mismanagement, an area that we will later on discuss oppression and mismanagement. Then receive a copy of any written resolution proposed by members. Require the directors to call a general meeting with a shareholding between 5 to 10 percent receive a notice of general meetings including the general annual general meeting and extraordinary general meeting. Require company to circulate a statement in relation to any general meeting with at least 5 percent shareholding. Demand a poll with at least 10 percent shareholding. Appoint a proxy to vote at general meetings. Inspect records of resolutions and general meetings without a charge approve donations to political parties with simple majority and receive a copy of the company's annual accounts and reports on request when circulated generally. So, these are the main rights we can see in the Companies Act for the benefit of the minority shareholders, but there are more, there are more in exhaustive list of minority shareholders rights. So, in order to protect minority shareholders, section 99 of the Companies Act imposes restriction that a company shall not take 
any action that would affect the rights attached to shares unless that action has been approved by special resolution of each interest group majority shareholder group minority shareholder group the rights attached to share of the minority shareholders include the rights privileges limitations and conditions attached to share under this act or the articles of the company including voting rights and rights to distributions such as dividends payment of dividends then preemptive rights that minority shareholders might have procedure involving minority buyouts procedure involving minority buyouts whenever the company wants to buy minority shares so there has to be a proper procedure of buying not to cheat the minority shareholders in buying so and any further procedure required by the articles of the company for the amendment or alteration of the articles observed by the company and the right that a procedure required by the articles of a company for the amendment or alteration of the articles not be amended or altered so these are some of the leading rights that are pronounced statutorily specifically by our act in the event that a shareholder require company to purchase his shares now suppose that a com that a company requires to buy back the minority shares then he may do so or the company may do so by giving a written notice to the sorry the, the shareholder minority shareholder then must give a written notice to the company if a minority shareholder wants to sell his shares back to the company so that the company can take over the shares sometimes there are minority share buyback in order to attract a major shareholder who will be investing in the company at a future time in order to distribute the shares or sub give uh, the shares to such shareholder the company may request all the minority shareholders are you willing to sell your share minority shareholder if he gets a good deal good offer might be willing to sell his share he saw her share at a considerably higher rate than what he bought for so in such a situation the minority shareholder can notify the company of his or he, her intention to sell the share to the company and the company can buy back such share so in that case if a minority shareholder intending to sell his shares give back the shares to the company he can do so by giving a written notice to the company and within 10 working days of the passing of the resolution at a meeting of the shareholders that minority shareholder or the shareholder has uh demonstrated he saw her intention to give back the shares so when a general meeting has been called and the minority shareholder has decided to give back the shares or sell rather then within date within 10 days of that he has to give a written notice to the company of his intention to sell it there a resolution in writing signed not less than 85% of the shareholders who would be entitled to vote on the resolution at a meeting of the shareholders who together hold not less than 85% of the shares entitled to be cast on that resolution is made then before the expiration of 10 working days after the date on which the notice of passing the resolution is given to the shareholder so suppose that that particular situation with regard to the 85% of voting of uh, at least right is met out of the minority shareholders then within 10 days of such mm, uh, meeting written notice to be given by such shareholders to the 
company regarding the sale of the shares or giving back of the shares to the company. In such event, the board shall within 20 working days of receiving a notice. Now, this is a shareholders general meeting. So, when the company is notified by a minority shareholder or shareholders on their intention to sell the shares, that notice sent to company means that it is the board that is receiving, the board of directors. Then the board will take cognizance of that and within 10 working days of receiving such notice, agree to purchase of the shares by the company. Within 21 days, the board has to either agree or disagree. So, if they are agreeing to, they have to effect within 21 days after receiving. Or they can also arrange for some other person to agree to purchase the shares. Either the shares are taken back to the company or the board arranges some other party to buy those shares within the 21 day window or apply to the court for an order if they fall under section 797 exempt from obligation to purchase. If the company is not willing to buy the shares and unable to pay or whatever, then the company if also there is no other purchaser, the, it is the company that has to then report to the court, court of this particular arrangement of the minority shareholders and they have to seek an order of the court, competent court uh, to be exempt from obligation to purchase the shares that the minority is now offering or section 98 if the company is insolvent. In case where the company is insolvent, the board has to then again, I mean the board has to yet seek order of the court before it purchases the shares of the minorities or arrange before taking the action concern for the resolution be rescinded, uh, rescinded in accordance with article with section 92 special resolution or decide in the appropriate manner not to take action concern or what the board can take, board can do is to arrange before taking the action concern for resolution with regard to this matter further resolution with regard to this matter and which is a special resolution of course or otherwise decide in appropriate manner not to take action with regard to the offer. offer. The board shall give written notice to the shareholder of the board's decision under its subsection. So, whatever the decision that the board takes thereafter has to be notified back to the particular minority shareholder or shareholder who is offering such shares. As per section 95, where the board agreed to purchase of the shares buy back by the company, then the board shall on giving notice of it within 5 working days. So, after giving notice to the shareholder that the company will buy back the shares, then within 5 working days nominate a fair and reasonable price for the shares to be acquired. So, the board has to decide on the value for the share. Now, when it comes to value for the share in buyback is that they have to determine the value or rather nominate a value, give an offer for the shares based on fair and reasonable amount which would not prejudice the shareholder and which reflects the company's capacity, ability, this share is therefore based on such determinant and said to be fair and reasonable in that case. And the shareholder shall forthwith, sorry, the uh, nominate a fair and reasonable price and give notice 
and give notice to the price nominator to the holder of those shares and give notice of such. The shares are deemed to have been purchased by the company upon receipt of the shareholder of the notice like price. So, when the notice is given from the board to the particular shareholder and the shareholder when receiving the board communication of buying back the share that constitutes the contract that the shares are now purchased by the company at that particular price. A shareholder who considers that the price nominated by the board is not fair and or reasonable shall forth will give notice to the of objection to the company. If the shareholder is not happy, satisfied with the amount that he is going to receive from the company per share, then the shareholder shall immediately write a letter of objection to the price. It is not about offer, it is about the amount that the shareholder is not uh, happy or satisfied with the amount proposed or nominated by the company. If within 10 working days of giving notice to a shareholder, now once the board gives the notice of the fair price, within 10 days no objection to the price has been received by the company where the shareholder has not objected to that price by writing, then the company shall forthwith pay the price nominated. So, the shareholder cannot sleep on it. The shareholder either has to object or accept because if he does not object within 10 days, 10 working days, 10 working days it is said to have been purchased by the company and then the company shall forthwith pay price nominated to the shareholder and the shareholder shall forthwith deliver any share certificate in respect of the shares of the company that is in that shareholder's possession, custody, had to return. If within 10 working days of giving notice to a shareholder, if the shareholder present an objection letter, an objection to the price has been received by the company, then the company shall within 5 working days, 5 working days, after the question as to what amounts to a fair and reasonable price to the auditors of the company, then the company board shall refer the matter to the auditors of the company to determine what should be the fair and reasonable price. Now, in this situation, the company auditors come into the picture if there is objection from the shareholder regarding the price of a share and then pay a provisional price in respect of the shares and also pay provisional price, not the final price, but the provisional price pay provisional price in respect of the shares equal to the price nominated by the board. So, for the time being the board is obliged to pay a provisional price which has been nominated by the board to the shareholder until the company auditor determines the fair and reasonable price per share. Upon payment of the provisional price by the company, the shareholder shall forth will deliver any share certificate in respect of the shares to the company. Now, once the provisional price is paid, then it is the duty of the shareholder to hand over, surrender the share certificates. But subject to the fact that the shareholder may obtain a higher value as determined by the auditor later. So, this has to happen within 10 working days of the notice to share shareholder and after that 5 working days from uh, receipt of an objection letter. Where a reference is made as to non-satisfaction of a fair price, if there is a reference of non-satisfaction of a fair price by the shareholder, then the auditor shall expeditiously determine. Now, this is very important expeditiously without any delay right? 
has to determine the auditor has to determine the fair and reasonable price. When determining the fair and reasonable price, the auditor will always look at the exact financial stability of the company and according to the company's capability and the car and the uh, ability, the auditor will determine the real price which is said to be the then the fair and reasonable price per share. Where the price determined exceeds the provisional price already paid, the company shall forthwith pay the balance owing to the shareholder. Where it is less than the provisional pri price already paid, then the shareholder is obliged to repay the excess to the company. So, this is how the auditor's determination would operate in the determining of the fair and reasonable price of a share in a buyback situation by the company. Where the company fails to refer the question to the auditors. Now, suppose that the company fails to refer the matter to the auditors. Then a shareholder who has given notice of objection and a shareholder not satisfied with the price as determined may apply to the court. Then he has to go to the court to appoint a fit and proper person for the purposes of determining a fair and reasonable price for the shares and the court may appoint such person as it thinks fit to report back to the court of the price that he determines, he or she determines as the fair and reasonable price per share. A person so appointed by court may award interest according to the relevant provisions. So, a person so appointed by the court may award interest if the matter delays for the either the, the loss, I mean basically the, the loss that may occur to the shareholder because it is the shareholder who has already fulfilled his surrendering of the shares. As per section 97, a company to which a notice has been given for the purchase of shares by the shareholders may apply to court for an order accepting, exempting it from the obligation to purchase. So, when the company does not intend to buy back the shares and it is not in a position to buy back, then in that case the company can seek exception from the court and put the matter to the court to decide obligation to purchase the shares to the notice relates on the ground that the purchase would be disproportionately damaging to the company or the company cannot reasonably require to finance the purchase. So, in that case it is then for the court to determine what the company has to do. If the court decide that the company cannot purchase, the shareholder will have no option then retaining the shares with himself or herself. So, the selling of the shares will not take place. On an application in respect of an exception, when the company makes an application to the court for an exception, exemption likewise, the court may make an order exempting the company from the obligation to purchase the shares like I mentioned before and may take any other order it thinks fit including an order setting aside a resolution of the shareholders, directing the company to take or refrain from taking any action specified in the order, requiring the company to pay compensation to the shareholders affected or that the company be wound up by the court whatever that is more appropriate and prudent in the judgment of the court to take in relation to this particular company. However, the court shall not make an order unless it is satisfied that the company has made reasonable efforts to arrange for another person to purchase the shares. The court if found that the company is not capable of purchasing the shares of the shareholder then it shall not make any order obliging the company to buy back the shares. 
where a notice is given to a company for the purchase of the shares. And the board considers that after the purchase by the company of the shares, the company would fail to satisfy the solvency test. If the buyback has been done by the company, but the fact remains that after the buyback, because the money goes out of the company, the company cannot maintain its solvency test. Then, or the, the, the company and the company has made reasonable efforts to arrange for the shares to be purchased by another, to sell to another person in accordance with the relevant provisions, but has been unable to do so. The company shall apply to the court for an order exempting it from the obligation to purchase of those shares. So, in such a situation, again the company can go to court and seek an order exempting the company from buying back because if the company buy back and pay out the money to the shareholder, the company may not be able to satisfy its solvency or solvency test rather. So, because of that, the company can has the right to go to the court and seek exception that the company is unable to buy back the shares of this shareholder. The court may on application for exemption, when an application for exemption is made and where it is satisfied that after the purchase of the company shares, the company would fail to satisfy the solvency test <coughs> and the company has made reasonable efforts to arrange for the shares to be purchased by another person, make an order accepting the, comp accepting the company from obligation to purchase the shares. So, the court can pronounce that the company is not able to buy back the shares and also award an order suspending the obligation to purchase the shares and also make a order preventing the company from obtaining the shares. Likewise, for money transaction, such other order as it think fit. So, these are the areas that where purchase of shares mainly sold by the minority shareholders, the procedure operate. Next topic that we are going to talk about is of charges and registration of charges. Now, this is also a very important area in the company law and the companies act in particular in Sri Lanka. The charges that are imposed on a company, charges in the sense the liabilities that the company may have of some statutory nature, some statutory nature, not a kind of a breach of contract where the company becomes liable, but as of a statutory nature, the company becomes liable. Now, let us first of all see what is a charge, what is a charge that falls within this particular part of the Companies Act. As per section 102, a charge is a charge for the purpose of securing any issue of defenses. Charge is a charge that the company has to bear for the purpose of securing any issue of debentures, where the company invites for debentures from creditors who would like to give secured credit like in that case of Solomon and Solomon versus company. Debentures are secured credit. So, where secured credit are obtained, the charges against the secured credit debentures that the company has to meet are one of the is one of the charges under section 102. Then a charge on uncalled share capital of the company, a charge on uncalled share where a shareholder has not been called for the capital of the company, that amount remains as a liability in the company. Towards the company, then it is said to be a charge. A charge created or evidenced by an instrument which if executed by an individual would require registration as a bill of sale. 
a charge created or evidenced by an instrument which if executed by an individual would require registration as a bill of sale. When there is a bill of sale executed by the company, the amount that is to be received by the company becomes a charge of the company. A charge on land whenever, wherever situated or on any interest in the land is also a charge. A charge on books, debts, book debts of the company is a charge. A floating charge on the undertaking or property of the company, a floating charge. Then a charge on calls made but not paid is a charge. A charge on a ship or aircraft or any share in a ship or aircraft that is owned by the company is a charge. A charge on goodwill or intellectual property within the meaning of the intellectual property act number 36 of 2003 that is a charge and a, a trust receipt to which section 4 of the trust receipts ordinance applies or an inland trust receipt within the meaning of the inland trust receipts act number 14 of 1990 a trust receipt where a trust has been created for the benefit of a certain person, maybe a shareholder who would not be eligible to obtain shares, but in place a trust has been created. So, that trust received becomes a charge where the company is so liable towards that. A charge here also includes a mortgage, a mortgage that a company has placed is a charge. So, all these things as per the Companies Act section 102 falls within the meaning and context of a charge that a company may have. Now, let us go further and see how these operate. Where a company creates a charge, when a company creates a charge, it shall be the duty of the company within the time specified in the case of instrument executed in Sri Lanka be registered within 21 working days of the date of execution of the instrument and in the case of an instrument executed outside Sri Lanka be registered within 3 months of the date of execution of the instrument. So, where a company creates a charge it shall be the duty of the company within the time specified to cause a copy of the instrument whatever whether made in Sri Lanka or outside by which the charge is created or evidence be delivered to the registrar for registration under the act. So, whenever there is a charge imposed upon a company, it is the duty of the company secretary to inform to the com registrar of companies ROC of the charge that is being imposed against this company and it is to be registered with the register of companies. This is called registration of charges, where then the registrar will maintain the particular charges in the company's register of charges, register of charges, register of charges. The copy of the instrument so registered with the register of companies shall be accompanied by a certificate in prescribed form issued by a director or secretary, director or secretary of the company or an attorney at law verifying the copy as a true copy and containing the prescribed particulars of the charge. So, that the registrar can assume or he can assure or he can take connivance of the fact that there is a proper charge that has been imposed against the company and that now remains with in the records of the register of charges with respect to that particular company and therefore, the registrar has, registrar has the ability to find out what are the charges that are remaining in a particular company. Because whenever there, 
the, the company goes into bankruptcy or other issues, then the registrar is aware that certain charges remain on a company, against the company. So with that, I come to the end of today's lecture. I will be continuing the area of charges and thereafter we will be going to other areas such as offshore companies, uh, overseas companies and so forth in our next lecture series and thereafter we will be going into more of derivative actions, uh, uh, operation and mismanagement that I did earlier uh, in an instance I um, mentioned and we will also be going into the final areas in the next following lectures to come. So thank you very much for listening and I hope as every time that you have gathered very versatile and good knowledge about the company law in this CL4 corporate law area. Thank you very much for listening to my lecture and we will meet each other on the next day.